Yeah, the <clears throat> I thought I think the balloons are better looking, but you know. Anyway. Hallelujah. God is so good, isn't he? You know, this is also pretty cool because we started Rock Church, that's our kids uh, worship ministry back in September. And ever since then this this whole row is usually empty, but today I get to see my three sons. Da, 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 da. For those of you, da, da. I get to see my three sons in the front row, and, and, and it's, it's really wonderful to see them. Of course, Dan and Amber are visiting here. They were helping work on Dan's house, and they were here for the um, Sam's house. Yeah, they were working on a house. <laughs> <laughs> my brain is half here, so pray that the other half shows up while I'm preaching. <clears throat> God is good, amen? Hallelujah. We serve a wonderful Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Wonderful Jesus. He's a good God. And, uh, and he's a miracle-working God. Do you believe that God does miracles? He's a miracle-working God. In Psalm 77, verses 13 and 14, say this. Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. You are the God who performs miracles. This is who he is. He displays his power among the peoples. Now, when I look out in this way, you know what I see? Peoples. I see peoples. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the people. So, what, I, what that's saying to me is he displays his power among you. God has displayed his power among you. Oh, that we would have eyes to, to see uh, the power of God. And then uh, in first, or, yes, first Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, these have been our, our verses uh, concerning this teaching. Uh, Paul wrote to the, to the Corinthians, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence, or superior wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you with weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. And, and, and that's really you know, what, what the world is, is looking for today. That's what the world's looking for. They, they want to see the power of God. And I believe that in these last days, that this, that's what God is going to do in the church. If there's, a, if there's a church, if the church will truly seek God, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will heal, forgive their sin and I will heal their land and God will move in power in our land. It's really the only hope for our, our country. That This election this year it doesn't offer any hope for us as a people. No hope whatsoever. The only thing that offers us hope is if, if God is real and if he moves in power among us. You are a God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. And that's what, that's what God wants to see, and that's what the world wants to see. They want to see a church that's walking in the power of God. And one of the main ways that that power is manifested is in our daily lives. You see, the people of the world want to see, does, does Jesus Christ really make a difference in your life, or are you just like everyone else? but you go to church on Sunday. You see, people want to see that God's power is moving, that we're not just like everyone else, that God's power has done something in my life, that God's power has done something in your life, and I'm not like I used to be. I'm changed because the power of God is, is moving in me. This is what people are longing for. They want to see something real. And, 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 it's, and it's Jesus Christ. He's, he's better than Coca-Cola. He's the real thing. Amen. So today we're going to be going to the Gospel of Mark as our, as our text. And we're going to look at Jesus' healing of a blind man. The healing of a blind man. There were many men that were blind that Jesus healed. And, and uh, this, is, this is a really unique story. So I'm going to read this as, as my opening text. Mark 8, 
verses 22 through 26. Then we're going to pray, and we're going to hope. <laughs> hope. We're going to pray, and we're going to listen as God speaks to our hearts. Let him speak to us today. Mark 8. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I, I see people. They, they look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, and we praise you for your faithfulness. And Lord, I pray that today that we would just allow you to reveal to us how much you love us, that we would just allow you to take us by the hand away with you where you can move in power in our lives. So God, have your way. Help us today, Lord, and speak to us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. First thing we want to do in looking at this portion of Scripture, Mark chapter 8, is we, we want to consider this miracle. Uh, this, this miracle is unique to Mark's gospel. It's not in any of the other gospels. And it's also, it's, it's very s similar to the healing of the deaf mute in Mark chapter 7, which is just a, a, the previous chapter, obviously. And uh, and they're the only two miracles where Jesus used spittle. <sighs> Just think about that. You know, when I read that verse, Jesus spit on his eyes. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? It's not, you know, imagine if you came up for prayer and I went, and I spit on your eyes. <laughs> You'd never come back. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this idiot? I'm sorry. <laughs> you wouldn't come back. Jesus sometimes used what we might consider unconventional reasons and unconventional methods, rather, but there were reasons why he did everything he did. And, and we're going to look at that. So, again, it's, it's, it's only in, in Mark's gospel. And, and something that Jesus does in both Mark chapter 7 and here in Mark chapter 8, something that he does different than in other gospels, I mean in other mir miracles, uh, is he takes the person aside apart from everyone else. There's, there's something beautiful we're going to see in that. He takes the person aside uh, apart from everyone else. He takes, takes them to a place in private. And I just wanted to read this quote from Dr. McLaren because I just thought it was so, so, so beautiful when it talks about Jesus taking the sufferer away. Uh, and works the miracle in private. And he said this, he said, this fact of a miracle done in intended secrecy suggests to us the true point of view from which to look at the whole subject of miracles. He says, people say they were meant to be attestations of, div of his divine mission. In other words, they were to point to the fact that he was who he was. And, and, and yes, no doubt, that is true partially. But that was never the sole or even the main purpose for which they were wrought, for which his miracles were done. And when anyone asked Jesus to work a miracle for that purpose only, he rebuked the desire and refused to gratify it. He wrought his miracles not coldly in order to witness to his mission, but every one of them was the outcome of his own sympathetic heart brought into contact with human need. That's just, that's just so beautiful. Every one of them was the outcome of his own sympathetic heart 
brought into contact with human need. And instead of the miracles of Jesus Christ being cold, logical proofs of his mission, they were all glowing with the earnestness of a loving sympathy and came from him at sight of sorrow as naturally as rays from the sun. Jesus did it because he saw a need and because he wanted to reveal his love. And as naturally as the sun shines forth rays is his love for you and his desire to display his power among you and in your life. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. The other thing that's different about this miracle in chapter 8, and this makes it unique in that no other miracle happened this way. This story in chapter 8 is the only miracle of Jesus, the only one recorded that was done in stages. In other words, he asked him a question, do you see anything? And he said, I see men walking. And, he, and he, had to, had to, he had to do something again. He had to do two things in order for this man to be healed. And that's perplexed scholars and, and people along the way. Usually just at a word of Jesus, boom, it was done. Boom. Peace be still. Boom. There's no more storm. Lazarus, come forth. Boom, Lazarus comes out. He stops the dead man. I say to you, rise up. Son, your sins are forgiven. Rise up and walk. Boom, it's done. But this, in this miracle, it came more slowly. It came more gradually. It seems to labor, to come slowly. Like a, a physician who gives someone some salve and says, is it feeling better yet? Yeah, but it's not quite gone yet and let's put it on again and okay now now it's now it's all all gone and I remember one time having a conversation with some pastors and just you know couldn't understand why this was like this and why did why did it take two times and was there some deficiency in Jesus and that, of course that's just ridiculous but it has to do with you and me and it really helps to reveal something about you and me we're going to look at that today What is the meaning? What is the reason? What is the lesson of this unique miracle? And, and I think that there's, there's, two, there's two parts to it. And, and we're going to look at the first one real, very briefly. The, fir the first part of it is, is I think that this miracle that happened in stages, uh, and this isn't the main purpose. We're going to get to the main purpose in a moment. But it, it, it's a picture of the disciples. And it's a picture of you and of me in our relationship with God. And, and what do you mean by that, Pastor Mike? The disciples see, the disciples are walking with Jesus. They see all that he's doing. They see his miracles, as we've already talked about. You know, they, they see these things that I've even discussed. They, just before this, there was the feeding of the 5,000, and, and immediately before this was the feeding of the 4,000. One was with five loaves and two fishes, and one was with seven loaves and a few fish. And they, they see these tremendous miracles. Imagine, wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to see a miracle like that? Wouldn't you like to be in a boat with Jesus and, and the storm is raging and you're, you're going up and down like this and most of us, you know, the, even the drama mean doesn't help us and, and, uh, and then all of a sudden he just says, peace be still and all of a sudden it's completely still? I mean, wouldn't that be the most awesome thing that ever happened in your life? But would that be enough to open our eyes? Go back to Mark chapter 6. And, and Jesus has just fed the 5,000. And Pastor Sam spoke about this, this, this portion of Scripture last week where, where Jesus came walking to them out in the water. And, and he, he fed the 5,000 with the five loaves and two fish. And then he sends his disciples away into the boat. And they're, and, and they're on their way out there. And, and, and then Jesus starts walking out to them. And, and they cried out because they, they, they were terrified when they saw him. And, and verse 51 says, or, or verse 50 says, because they saw all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were, then it says this, they were completely amazed. This, 
for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. They, could, they, had, they did not understand about the loaves. They saw the miracle. They, they, they see. In other words, do you see? Do you see anything? I see men walking like trees. Do you see anything? They saw, but they didn't see clearly. And sometimes I think that's you, and sometimes I think that's me, in our walk and in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We, 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 we read through the Word of God. We see that God is doing things, but, but we're not seeing clearly. And Jesus wants to bring us to that place where we see clearly. We, we go on from, from this point, and, and we go into Mark chapter 7, and, and he deals with clean and unclean, and then he heals the Syrophoenician woman's mother, and then he heals the deaf mute, which we talked about in a very similar fashion to the blind man. Then he feeds the 4,000, but, but listen, is right after he feeds the 4,000, again, the disciples are, are going into the boat, and it says this in verse 14 of chapter 18. He says, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And, and, and we might say today, be careful. Watch out for the yeast of the politicians and the religious leaders. But here, Verse 16 says, they discussed this with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see? and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven, and he said, do you still not understand? You see, they, they see, but not clearly. They see what Jesus is doing, but not clearly. And oftentimes in our lives, this may be our situation. We're seeing, but not clearly. We see men walking like trees in a spiritual sense. This is a picture of, of the disciples and where they were at. And they, they need another touch from God. They need another moving of his power and of his spirit. And God wants to, to do that. And when we get to the next chapter, right after this, this, this miracle of the heal, healing, and, and Jesus is, is predicting his death, rather it's in this chapter, at the end of chapter 8. I'm sorry, it's, it, it's chapter 8. And we see again that, that they see because Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And we know from Matthew's gospel, Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood has not re, uh, revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And then, then the next minute he declares to him, now I'm going to go up to Jerusalem, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna take captive the this, this Son of Man, they're going to beat him, scourge him, flog him, and then they're going to crucify him. And Jesus, and Peter takes him aside to rebuke him. They see, but not clearly. We see, but not clearly. Do you see anything? Yeah, we see men walking like trees. I have to confess that sometimes I feel like that's how I see things in the spirit realm. And I pray. I pray, God, open my eyes. Help me to see the things that you want me to see, not, not the physical things that you want me to see. I don't want to just see the natural, physical uh, moving of your power, but I want to understand who you are. This, this was Paul's cry. Imagine the Apostle Paul. Uh, who, had, who had actually, as we, we know from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, is he, was, he was brought up to heaven. And he saw things that, that are, were not permitted to talk about, he said. He saw things about God. He says, to keep me from being conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh. You know, I mean, he was, he was seeing things that we're not supposed to talk about, but yet he is the same one who was able to, to cry out to the Philippians, I want to know him. See, we see but not clearly. So one of the reasons I think that this miracle is put in and put right in the place that it's put in because it's right smack in the middle of all of this, it's to show us we see, 
but not clearly. But God wants to bring us into that place of clear vision. God wants to bring us to the place of clear vision. So now let's, we've beheld the miracle. And one of the reasons, we're going to look at, at another reason why the miracle happened this way now. So in order to do that, we need to consider the man. The miracle is an extraordinary miracle, but now let, let's, who, let's consider the man that the miracle happened to. And you know, there is not a whole lot for us to look at if we want to know about him. Just one verse. But, but let's, let's, let's read that verse real quickly here. Verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to, tuck, to touch him. That's all we know. We don't know a whole lot. So what can, what, can we, what can we know about this man? What sort of man was he? You know, if we look, at, again, looking at the narrative, there's just that one sentence about him. How, how, what, what, what can we figure out about this man? What do we know uh, about this man that, that came to Jesus? Guess what? That's one of the things we can, we can realize. He didn't come to Jesus. He was brought. He was, he was brought to Jesus. Um... He was from, Jesus was in Bethsaida. They brought him to Jesus in Bethsaida. Now, that was on the eastern shore of Galilee. Some, of the, some scholars believe that, that this man might have been from the Decapolis area. Um, Bethsaida was, there's actually, some scholars say there were two Bethsaidas. Some say there was, you know, one. But, you know, there's all this talk about it. But, but it, there's, they, they say that this man could have been a Gentile that was brought to Jesus. Others, just, others think he was a Jew. It doesn't really matter, but... <laughs> But, you know, Bethsaida was that place where Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 11 that, uh, woe to you, he says, uh, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So this was one of the places where Jesus had performed many miracles. But like we talked before, miracles don't make us see clearly, do they? So... So he was, he, he was in this place in Bethsaida, possibly a Gentile, but he, he didn't come to Jesus on his own accord. They brought him to Jesus. People brought him to Jesus. And then thirdly, it says that, and begged Jesus to touch him. He is not begging Jesus to touch him. They are begging Jesus to touch him. He's not praying. They're praying. They brought him to Jesus. This, this man very possibly did not come, did not want to come maybe even. And, and he's looking out and he's thinking, you know, what can, you know, if, if he was a Gentile, he might be, what can this Jewish man do for me or why would he even do anything for me? If he's a Jewish man still, if he's a Jewish man, he's, he's one who's, who's struggling. See, this man didn't ask anything of Jesus. He didn't ask Jesus to heal him. Those who brought him begged Jesus, prayed for Jesus. So this tells us something about this man and his faith, where, where he was at. Remember how we talked uh, a few weeks ago about Mark chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, and this is when Jesus was in his own hometown. And, and it, it, it says this, that he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Listen, he could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. So this is pointing to something that, 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 that helps us to understand maybe a little bit better why this miracle came slowly or in two stages. You see, because... You know, God has set principles that he adheres to. And when there isn't faith on our part, it makes it very hard for God to move in our lives. He couldn't do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. And you know what? I, I cry out like the man in, in, in Mark chapter 9 whose son they brought to Jesus because he was possessed of a demon and, and the disciples couldn't do anything about it. Jesus comes down and says, you know, um, what do you want me to do for you? He says, if you can do anything. Jesus said, if you can. 
all things are possible to him who believes. And then he said this, I do believe. Help my unbelief. And so, like the disciples who aren't seeing clearly, this man, he, he isn't believing. Now, there's another clue that we get to, to this man's life that we see from his answer when Jesus asks him, do you see anything? What does he say? I see men walking like trees. Uh, uh, how does it exactly say that? I see people. I see men. They look like trees walking around. Now, you know, that, that's a hint to me of something about this man. I'm thinking... That because he knew what a tree looked like, that at one time, it doesn't tell us, but I'm believing that this man wasn't born blind. I have a feeling that this man grew up seeing, and somehow, somewhere along the way, he lost his vision. He lost his sight, and, and something happened in him at that point. He, he lost hope. He, he fell into despair. Have you ever been in circum, uh, circumstances in your life where, where it seems all hope is gone? And where you can even fall into despair. Have you ever been there before? You know, um, the, the, the Jesus doesn't, doesn't hide who we are. You know, in, in, in 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says that, that we, were, we were beaten in these places beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life. That's what the Apostle Paul says, that there was a point in his ministry where there, he, there were so many attacks coming against him. He says, we despaired even of life. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, he said, who raises the dead. And here's this man, because of the certain, now see, Suzanne has a cousin and, and, and has two sons, and they have a degenerative eye disease. So they, when they were young, they could see perfectly. And the older they got, the worse their eyesight became, to the point where I believe at this point they're, they're completely, totally blind. They're, they're about my son's age. It's not her cousin, but her cousin's children. Blind. This could have been the case of this man. I see people walking like trees. And so the fact that he had once been able to see and now is no longer able to see, it, it puts him in despair. I think, of the, I think of John the Baptist. What was John the Baptist's sole purpose in life? He says in John chapter 1, when Jesus is walking by, he says to his, to his disciples, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He says, I would, have not, I would not have known who he was except for the one who sent me to baptize. He said, he upon whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He is the one. And he sent them to follow Jesus. Now, later on, what happens to John the Baptist? Well, he, he opposes Herod because Herod has son, done something unlawful. He has taken his brother's wife. And so John the Baptist tells him, what you're doing is wrong. So, so what does Herod do? Herod being king and having all, all the power he wants, what is he? he throws John in prison because he can do it. And when John's in prison, what does he do? He, his the circumstances have all changed. And he's, 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 he's maybe even wondering, you know, was Jesus the one after all? Because he sends his disciples to Jesus with that very question. Lord, are you the one or should we look for someone else? He's already pointed him out and said, behold, the lamb. You see, this is what despair can do to us. This is what circumstances, situations that we're in, it can do to us. It can bring us to that place where we despair even of life. Where, yeah, there's this Jewish guy and he's doing miracles, but, you know, he doesn't care about me. And what, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. No, we need to bring you. No, I don't want to go. Why would he even look at me? What, what does he care about me? I'm cursed. I, I used to be able to see and now I can't see we saw a few weeks ago right that I th thought if you became blind or if you were paralyzed it was because of some sin in your life you've done something wrong and God doesn't love you anymore God doesn't care about you and this might have been where he was he doesn't he's not interested in me I'm a sinner I'm blind he no come we need you to come with us no I don't want to go why no come come They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a man, a blind man, and begged Jesus to touch him. You see, he, he didn't beg. More than likely, he did not come of his own accord. But they brought him to Jesus. That's the man. I love what 
Dr. McLaren said at this point, he said, There's, how was Jesus to get to him? To reach this man who was unable to see the compassion and love and care on, on the face of Jesus. He said, there's one thing possible. To lay hold of this man by the hand and the touch, gentle, loving, firm, says this at least. Here is a man that has some interest in me. And whether he can do anything or not for me, he's going to try something. He's going to try something. And he leads him away from everyone else. Because at this point, he's interested only in this man. You see, at some point in your life and in your walk with Jesus, he's going to want to lead you away from everything else, from everyone else, because he's interested only in you. Yes, only in you. He wants you. He wants you. He wants to raise you up out of that place of despair. He wants, but he wants to do it with his truth. So he's not going to, I believe that the miracle in stages is for this man's sake. Not because he couldn't have done it all at once. And also, again, because of the fact that Jesus does work by his principles, the laws that he set in place. We're going to look at that again in a moment. But I believe this is what Jesus did for me. In my life, you know, as a young Christian, and sometimes God does this, you know, as a young Christian, God does allow things in your life where you see the power of God in your life. And, and as a very young baby Christian, this, this happened. I'm going to just give you two quick examples. And, and you, you've heard, you've heard, it doesn't matter. I'm going to give you two quick examples. But when I was first saved, before I was actually discipled, I was at my, my best friend Bill Wilger's house, and, and all of a sudden his mom came into the room screaming that she was sick and that, that her, male, her, her disease had come upon her again, whatever it was, and she's, she's just, go get your father, because they, they lived on a farm and he was out in the fields. Go get your father, go get your father. It's, it's happened again, it's happened again. And, and she's laying on, and she's, oh, and she's like laying, just laying out like this with her hand out like this, and I'm sitting in a rocking chair because I'm, I'm like right next to her, really, thinking, Lord, what do I do? And I'm praying, Lord, help Mrs. Wilger right now. Help Mrs. Because I just gotten saved. Just gotten saved as a brand new believer. Just didn't really know anything about God. And I just heard the Lord's whisper. Take her by the hand. What, Lord? Take her by the hand. Her hand is out like this. She's, she's laying down and she's moaning, moaning. Someone in the meanwhile, they've run out. They're going to get, get Mr. Wilger. I slowly reach out my hand and just put my hand in hers. The second I touch her hand, she jumps up. You did it! You did it! And she's emotional, ecstatic, unbelievable. You did it! You did it! I'm, I'm, it's gone! It's gone! And I'm like, what did I did? I didn't did anything. That's the only time that's, that's happened for me. Where I prayed for someone and immediately, well, there was one other time I prayed for someone There was immediate, it was Brittany Pachuski. But, God did that for me to show me his power. Then later on, you all know the story. I'm in the, the church, the, a Protestant church for the very first time in my life. I've raised Catholic, never been in any other church but a Catholic church. And, and um, you, you, you know the story. Uh, 
uh, there, there's drums, guitar, everything here. I'm not used to that. I'm like, what in the world's going on here? But everybody's clapping, singing, people raising their hands. And I'm saying, I can't do this, God. I can't, I can't sing in church. I can't clap my hands in church. I can't lift up my hands in church. I can't do this. And then there's a message in tongues and interpretation that says, do not say I cannot do this. And I am floored. God spoke to me, and I just fall into my seat weeping uncontrollably, can't stop myself from just weeping and crying because God is speaking to me. God had shown me his power, but, but then he, he needed to take me away by myself because I was living in Illinois, and I was struggling, you know, with, with all my brothers still getting high and all this, and I'm struggling with all that stuff. And then well, this is why God brought me to New Hampshire, it's like the story here. He says, they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him, and he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. He took him completely outside of the village. He took me away from everything that I knew or that was, that was there to hinder me, and sometimes God wants to take us away. Now, that doesn't mean you have to do what I did. You don't have to go to New Hampshire. Or you don't have, but, but what this is talking about is the first thing that Jesus does is he, he wants to be alone with this person. Jesus, he wants to be alone with, and Jesus wants to be alone with you. He wants you to get alone with him. He wants alone time with you. It will change your life. He wants it on a regular basis. The next thing that Jesus did when he took the man apart to be alone, we're considering Jesus, by the way, now. I'm sorry. I was <laughs> we considered the miracle. We considered the man. Now we're considering Jesus. Jesus wants to take you by the hand and take you into a, a, a solitary place with him. He wants there to be that place that's just for you and him, every one of us. He wants to take us by the hand and bring us to a solitary place because God moving in power in our life is, is great, but it, it's got to be much deeper than that. If that's all it is, that's just a surface relationship. That's why he tells uh, in, in, the, in the parable of the, of the uh, which one is it, the, the, the good house and the bad house. <laughs> he tells them to dig down deep. And put your foundation on the rock. This is what God wants us to do. He wants us to dig down deep. He, he doesn't want just a, a shallow, uh, he doesn't want our foundation to be upon the sand or, or without being on a rock. He wants us to dig down deep. It's, it's got to be more than just a surface relationship. So he wants to get alone with us. And then, and then what Jesus is, does there is he, is he stoops down to meet us where we're at. Jesus stoops down to meet us where we're at. In other words, he used something for this man that he could understand. Spittle <laughs> and touch. To help this man along in his faith. He, he wants to help him along. God stoops to feeble faith, and he gives it outward things by which it may rise to an apprehension of spiritual realities. In other words, this man's faith was small, so Jesus, more than he wants this man to be healed, he wants this man to believe. And so he uses outward things that can help this man. Like, like with Peter, what did he say to Peter? Peter, let down your nets for a catch. He used something that Peter was familiar with to help him. So he used something that this man would know. He used something that he said, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I have to do something to help this man's faith along. And so I'm going to use spittle and I'm going to use my touch. And, 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 and I'm going to help to bring this man along, to, to bring him along in his, in, in his faith. He stoops. I love, I love what 2 Samuel says. And, and your translation is not going to say it this way, but, and neither will the one that you see on the screen, but the, the original NIV says it this way. In, in, in verse 31 of 2 Samuel, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. 
He's a shield for all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. And then this is how it says it in the old NIV. You give me your shield of victory. You stoop down to make me great. I believe it just says help here. You stoop down to to make me, you broaden the path beneath me so that my ankles do not turn. He stoops down to make me great. Many translations say help. The King James Version, the ESV, say his gentleness. The Young's Literal talks about his lowliness. And when you look up this word in Brown Driver Briggs, the, the Hebrew lexicon, it, it defines it this way, to be bowed down, to become low, afflicted, humble. Jesus stoops down to make us great. He, he stoops down to this man because he wants this man to believe. More than, more than he wants him to be healed, he wants him to believe because that is healing. Do you, do you understand that? That is healing. You know, see, Fran Wharton may not ever come out of the, 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 the situation from her stroke, and she's, but she's accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, and she's healed. Her sins are forgiven. She, 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 is, she is cleansed by his blood. And then one commentator put it this way also, just so that we don't, don't get drawn off to the, to the whole thing about the, the saliva and the touch. It says, if Christ's touch and Christ's saliva healed, it was not because of anything in them, but because he willed it so. And, and he himself is the source of all healing. And therefore, let us keep these externals in their proper place of subordination. Remember that in him, not in them, it, uh, lies the healing power. I, I remember, <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. Okay, I don't have time. And then Jesus waits on a slow faith. Jesus takes the man alone to be with him. He stoops down to a feeble faith, and he waits. He waits on a slow faith. Jesus is drawing us along. He's drawing you along. He asked, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. This whole process was determined by the man's faith. Get that. This whole process was determined by the man's faith, and it was meant to increase it. The things that God allows and the things that God is doing in our life is, to, is, is, is determined by our faith. If you want to see the power of God working in your life, it's, it's determined by your faith. And, 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 and that's why he takes us alone to be with him, because faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. But uh, anyway, let me read this, this, this quote. He was healed slowly because he believed slowly. His faith was a condition of his cure, and the measure of it determined the measure of the restoration. As a rule, faith in his power to heal was a condition of Christ's healing, and that mainly because our Lord would rather make men believing than sound of body. They often wanted only the outward miracle, but he wanted to make the means of indicating a better healing in their spirits. And he usually worked on people this way. If you go back to Matthew chapter 9, verses 28 and 29, th this is what's happening there. Th this is the, G Mar Matthew's telling of, the, of the, the healing of the blind mute. And in verse 28, it says, When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, the Lord replied. So then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, will it be done to you? According to your faith, will it be done to you? Look at Hebrews 11, verse 6. What does Hebrews 11, verse 6 say? Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This man didn't come seeking Jesus. This man was in despair. He was brought to Jesus, maybe kicking and screaming. He was brought to Jesus because maybe he didn't even think he was worthy. But Jesus wanted to bring him along, and he wanted to bring him to that place of faith where he would believe, because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we, we read earlier that Jesus could not do many miracles there because of, because of their lack of faith. He was amazed at their lack of faith. He said all he could do was touch a few people and heal them. If we want to see God moving in our lives, we've got to get to that place where we allow Jesus to take us by the hand and lead us off to be alone, that we allow him to stoop down to us and, and, and to, to lift us up out of the ashes and that we allow him to show us where we're at with him, to be honest with him, and, and, and to allow him to, to bring us to that place where, where our faith rises up so that though we saw men walking like trees, now he touches us again 
And then it says that his eyes were opened and his sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. See, that's where Jesus wants to bring you and that's where Jesus wants to bring me. He wants to bring us to that place where we see everything clearly. I'm going to ask the worship team to come, to come up right now. We're going to close here. One last quote says, How dim and partial a glimmer of light comes in to many a soul at the outset of the Christian life. How little a new convert knows about God and self and the starry truths of his great revelation. Christian progress does not consist in seeing new things. Don't, don't be looking for something new. Christian progress does not consist in seeing new things, but seeing the old things more clearly. God wants us to see more clearly. The same Christ, the same cross, only more distinctly and deeply apprehended and more closely incorporated into our very being. Brothers and sisters, he's a good, good father. He's a good, good father. That's who he is. That's who he is. That's who he is. And you, you are loved by him. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. He knows that you're blind. He knows that you're poor. He knows that you're afraid. He knows that you have little or no faith. And he loves you. He takes you by the hand. And he draws you away to be with him. He touches you and everything changes. Let him touch you right now as we just worship him and stand to our feet.